So uh, um, we have to keep two principles in mind at all time. One, one of them is that um, our supporting free speech is one of our foremost obligations as a university, and you want engaged disagreement about topics that uh, matter. You hope that that disagreement will be uh, civil. You hope that it will be scholarly and informed. Do you know that sometimes when you have students reacting in the moment and off the cuff, they are going to uh, say things that they may regret uh, later and that don't reflect the institution's position. But you have to be protecting free speech. The mm -hmm. second thing you have to do is look for ways to speak up for the values of the community in ways that are, are consistent with the obligation to uh, protect sp free speech. So I and every other university president mm -hmm. uh, will face questions about whether or not we're going to put out a statement on a particular incident or event around the world, mm -hmm. in general, we're going to be cautious about uh, doing that. Uh, but most of us have spoken out about this particular issue. But do you think it's harder to do that in this particular environment where it just seems a little bit more politically charged, not just on the issue of Israel and Palestine, but on a lot of other issues, culture war issues here in the country as well? It's a super hard yeah. thing to do on, on lots of different mm -hmm. issues for exactly the, the reasons that you uh, raise. Y universities should be places where where uh, there are students from many different uh, backgrounds and where there are uh, many different viewpoints represented both on the faculty and in the, the student body. When you start, start talking about the alumni and more broadly, lots of different constituencies. And as you say, right now we have uh, wide polarization around those issues. Uh, different people are going to hear messages very differently. Yeah. What's the mood like on campus right now? Well, there's a lot of uh, anguish and, and anger, obviously, over the murderous attacks that uh, Hamas made in uh, Israel. Uh, but at Princeton, at least, the discourse right now is uh, civil. People are asking themselves what their, what their obligations are, but also uh, supporting one another during this uh, period. Mm -hmm. I ask because you um, are a scholar of religious freedom. You have testified this several times. Does Princeton play a role in guiding or moderating the, the dialogue, the conversations taking place? We, we do that in a variety of ways. Right? Part of what we do is uh, try to model for our students at all times uh, what it is that um, we want from scholarly exchange. At Princeton right now, when we have freshmen who are coming on campus, uh, one of the uh, modules in their orientation is a module around free speech mm -hmm. that is not just about the need to respect free speech principles, but also the importance of having civil dialogue about issues that uh, matter. We expect all of our faculty members to be promoting this in their classrooms. Mm -hmm. And some of our uh, faculty members are writing in a scholarly way about what it means to uh, protect civil dialogue, yeah. what academic freedom means, and what free speech is. I, I don't envy your job, or really the job of any uh, university president right now, because in addition to whatever we're going through right now in this debate, there's also been, of course, a lot of other, uh, if you will, criticisms of the way colleges and universities have gone about, whether it's with their admission processes, trying to create a more uh, diverse campus, as well as other issues here. Uh, is there a sense here that when you see the pushback, like let's just take the Supreme Court ruling on affirmative action, and really just the multi-decade drumbeat to try to sort of do away with some of these programs here, how do you still remain steadfast to your ethics, your ethos, and your mission to create a more diverse campus when now you have something that is enshrined in law that says be careful how you trade? Yeah. Let me just say one thing before I get to that, which yeah. is I feel like you should envy me and other university <laughs> presidents, because the jobs are hard, but there are all these yeah. issues, but, but what we get to do is spend time with the most extraordinary scholars and some of the most extraordinary young people in the world and help them to, to, to flourish. But, but part of doing that well is, is, is sustaining the diversity that makes our campuses so vibrant. And one of the things I firmly believe and that we believe at Princeton is that in order to be excellent, we have to be drawing talent from every sector of society. So the recent decision out of the Supreme Court changes the tools that we have available to to do that. The Supreme Court has said that you can't make selections on the basis of uh, race alone or even race as one particular factor in a uh, decision-making process right now. But you can take it into account when you're looking at how a particular individual's experiences may 
may have been shaped by their identity, racial or otherwise, or about how it is that uh, their contributions to the community might be shaped. So um, we've worked under a lot of these restrictions in the past as we've tried to diversify and had some success at diversifying our uh, faculty. We have uh, trained our admissions team to make sure they comply with the law to do things differently, mm -hmm. but to continue to push for excellence and diversity. Yeah, in the meantime, it uh, sounds like it's a very careful evaluation of every application. And of course, schools like Princeton get so many more applications than they have spots for. At some point, that flood of applications comes at a cost to the school. How do you cope with the increase in this flood of applications? Do you hire more admissions officers? Do you rely on AI in any way? We don't rely on AI. We do hire more admissions officers. We think it's important to read carefully and to read in a way consistent with our institutional values and the law. The other thing we're doing is expanding the undergraduate student body, right? So By how much? We, we are uh, undergoing a 10% expansion uh, right now that will add 500 students to what was a 5,200 uh, person um, student body. And our board of trustees has said once we, once we finish that expansion, we should be ready to expand again, including through a transfer program. So so one of the things that we've added is a program that takes community college transfers and military veterans, and we're going to continue to grow that over time. I am curious about uh, some of the uh, concern here about the cost of a college degree, and more importantly, the payoff of that college degree once you get into the workforce. As I'm sure you know, uh, there are a lot, there's a certain generation that has really kind of reevaluated that prospect of whether they or their parents want to spend 100 grand or whatever it is these days uh, to do that here. I mean, how do you respond to that in terms of the value process? Position uh, to go to a school like Princeton or any other school for that matter that could potentially set them in debt for several years. Yeah, I think a college education uh, at um, a very wide range of colleges and universities is one of the best education, uh, one of the best investments that people will make over the course of their lifetime, taking into account the cost and taking into account foregone income. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a great study out of the New York Federal Reserve that uh, documents this, and they continue to. Uh, to update it, the exact numbers vary. What's really important is that people focus on this on, as, on this as an investment, and they focus on completing the degree. Right? If you complete an undergraduate degree at a respectable college or uh, university, including mine, but including a wide range of others, you're going to get earning power afterwards that allows you to pay back those uh, debts. But completion is essential to that. Yeah. I got to ask you about legacy consideration. Wesleyan joined Amherst and Johns Hopkins in removing legacy consideration for admissions. How are you thinking through that? Are Princeton alumni engaging with the school about this? We have um, a, a board of trustees committee, and we've announced this uh, publicly, that is looking at we, what we call admission priorities, which would include things like legacy preference. What I will say generally is that at Princeton University, our bond with our alumni is a great strength of the university. It allows us to do things like expand the student body in the way that we were just discussing, while also increasing financial aid to students and making sure they have the same opportunities as their predecessors. Our expansion will create more seats than all of the seats that we give to our uh, legacy students as we go through this, this initial expansion and then a second one. So part of what we're asking Right is is all right. What's the best way for us to continue forward on an, uh, a mission that depends on sustaining those bonds with our alumni and sustaining diversity at the university? 